Welcome everyone to Teach Me PCB. I'm Mark, the creator of Teach Me PCB and one of the co-facilitators of this year's this year's course, along with Jesse Robinson. And this hour is all yours. I'm here to answer any questions that you have about your design, my design, or anything in between. Um, Tonight, I wanted to talk a little bit about electrostatic discharge and protection against it. And I'll give a little time for our guests who are interested in that to show up. And uh, we can talk a little bit about our parts box, what I'm going to be shipping out here uh, in the next week or so. I'm going to have to get on that one. Um, and anything else that you have in mind. So please join me if you're at YouTube. The, uh, I guess, ooh, how do I get you a link? I posted a link in the, um, ooh, I posted a link I know on our Discord, but let me see if I can't put it up at the bottom of the screen here in case anybody wants to join. Uh, copy to clipboard and post a comment. And then make comment visible. Here we go. So if you're out there watching and lurking and you want to know what's going on, visit in. Come join me over here. All right. Um, let's get started with ESD, electrostatic discharge. It's something that a lot of engineers, especially new engineers, just don't take seriously. And like a lot of problems that you know you don't necessarily have to take seriously, they cause problems that are insidious. Um, they occur much later on down the road. Hi, Elliot. Nice to see you, buddy. Join me on screen if you like. Um, some things like calf failure, uh, conductive anodic filament happens down the road. Creepage is a phenomenon that happens with higher voltage circuits. It happens on down the road. So you make your board and it works. You know, nothing wrong with it. But then, you know, two, three, four years down the road, sometimes two, three, four months down the road, it stops working and you have no idea why. And it's impossible for you to troubleshoot. Those are the types of problems that just absolutely just kill you. Um, and those are the ones that we try to help you avoid through better engineering. So let's get started with that. I'm going to switch to an overhead cam. And you and I, are going to do some experimenting. I guess uh, time for this latex to go through a little wash cycle. Got a little little stuff sitting around. All right, here's what you need: some tape. This is uh, Scotch brand magic tape. I selected it because it says magic on it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> You need magic. All right. What I'm going to show you next is magic. We're going to need four pieces of tape, each with an upturned edge to make them easy to peel back up later. Because if you put tape down on a, on a table, it's not always possible to get it back up. So that first piece of tape that I put down, I'm going to label it with something. The letter B. Second piece of tape I'm going to put down. I'm also going to label with the letter B. Whenever I can't remember the letter that comes before A and after C, my mother always tells me, letter B, letter B. It's a Muppet joke for you. All right, two more pieces of tape. These ones are going to go exactly on top of the first two. And these are going to get the letter T. I wonder if this would be any more visible against a different background. Let's see here. That's much easier to see. Let's do that. Okay, first letter B against a black background. 
so much easier to see. Second one against a black background. Again, so much easier to see. On top of those, I'm going to put two pieces of tape with the letter T. Now, anytime that you have, and eh, let's make a, another one that's a little bigger. Anytime that you have two insulators that are made of different materials and they're in contact with each other, they have the ability to exchange electrons, exchange charge. And it doesn't take very many electrons to make that happen um, for some pretty appreciable effects. So I'm just gonna rip the two top pieces off the two bottom pieces. And they're already doing things that I don't necessarily want them to do. Let me hold them up in front of my face. Oh, this way. These things are repelling the heck out of each other. Right? If I bring them back, they're, I mean, there's, there's two things. One, they're attracted to my hand. That's one problem I'm trying to fight. But the second thing is these things sure do repel. Now, if I set those to the side for a second and I pull up the two bottom pieces of tape, let me get them nice and stuck. They don't really want to stick to the silicone, but I'm going to make them. So let's see what the overhead. Nah, you can't see what the overhead cam. We got to do this one. Ah! Those things are repelling. And if you don't believe me, try it yourself, right? Easy experiment to do at home. We're going to do one more. I'm going to reset the experiment. The B's for bottom are on bottom, T's for top are on top. This time I'm going to rip up the top piece, then rip up the bottom piece. And see what happens. Oh, that is not what I expected. Let's do the experiment again. I had the top piece hit my hand. Wonder if that's what did it. If not, it's my silicone mat. There we go. So now these things are certainly attracted to each other. The Greeks figured this out, that you could have these materials with different properties and this was you know way back when um you know a couple thousand years ago maybe they even knew about it you know the ancients knew before that we just don't have it recorded in history but you know you could take a little piece of fur and a little piece of amber and rub them on each other you know you go get yourself a dead cat and scrub it and, and you could attract little pieces of lint and pith balls and all that sort of stuff um it was the first clue that we had these two different forces these two different electrical forces and really what's going on is you're you're stripping electrons off one so you've got one that's got um that's got extra electrons and you've got one that's missing electrons and they can attract each other or they can repel each other right if both of them have extra electrons or both of them are missing electrons there's no reason for them to come to each other that's the whole opposites attract likes repel thing let me mute this notification any time you have two different um, insulators near each other and they're able to move near each other, they're, one of them is going to attract electrons off. And based on where things are on the whole, I uh, can't remember if it's electronegativity scale or not. I, I feel like that's the wrong word for it. But you get triple electric charging, charging through friction. And it can absolutely fry your board. Now, um, when I was teaching high school physics, I had this thing called a Van de Graaff generator. I guess we don't need to be on a down view anymore. And essentially all it was was a piece of um, latex belt that would rub over and over on a piece of amber. And it would just keep stripping electrons um, 
And eventually you'd build up these huge charges on this giant metal sphere that you could then have students touch and it would zap them. And I always told them, you know, um, based on the length of the, the spark, we could get a rough estimate of how many, you know, many thousands of volts that I was zapping them with. And nobody ever believed me. Um, but, you know, on some days we could get up into the hundreds of thousands of volts without much problem. Other days, not so much. But all it takes to damage your circuit is usually a few hundred volts, maybe tens of volts. And just by lifting your foot up off the ground on some carpets or some linoleum floors, you can generate pretty easily, you know, four, eight, 12, 16,000 volts just by lifting your shoe once. Just by, you know, separating a couple pieces of paper. Anytime you have two insulators moving with respect to one another, you know, either separating by distance, moving across one another, you can get it. So what are some examples of that? Um, you've got, let's say you've got a remote control vehicle, the rubber tires on the asphalt floor. Movement, you're going to be stripping electrons. What about a CNC machine? Well, if it's a belt driven machine, absolutely. Where else? Well, if you've got a cable that's dangling and you know the air in the room's moving that can be enough so whenever you're doing stuff you always have to find a way to discharge your your circuit somehow so that those high voltages don't make it into your circuit so let's take a quick look and again feel free to join me on screen if you are so inclined uh, and let me pull up our circuit and we'll talk about it a little. It's getting a little warm in here though. Computer, turn on ceiling fan. Let's see if that helps any. All right, so we are going to do a share screen. And yes, share screen. Screen one, okay, and we'll make me tiny. And then we'll open up our schematic. Recent files still not working. I don't know why that is. All right. So over on our schematic, I've designed a little dancing dude. Right, kind of looks like a little dancing dude. This is his body. He's got a couple legs, a couple arms. So what's the purpose of this? Um, well, this is basically meant to discharge. If you ever get an accumulation of charge, either discharge that to the five volt net or discharge it to the ground net. So this is the USB connector. Yeah, so you have to imagine that a cable is connected to this and that cable might be able to accumulate some amount of charge and then transfer that charge into the wires. If it hits VBUS, if it hits ground, okay, not ideal, but we can probably, if the voltage gets too high, we can discharge through the reverse voltage, go, you know, go the wrong way through a diode. That's cool. But if it comes in on the differential pair, the D plus or the D minus, we've got two paths for it. So you have to imagine that if one of two things can happen, either one, the voltage can go uh, too high, you know, far high above ground potential, or it can go far too low below ground potential. And we've got paths for each cable, for each leg to do that. If I get uh, too much charge, any ideas which ways it's going to go? Hi, Jeremy. I see you joined us. Oh, why? There's the thing. And since I don't have any participants. All right. So typically the way that a diode works, you know, you've got your anode here and your cathode over here. Oh, I don't even know if my, is my pointer work? Oh, I don't know if it's working or not. Okay. So anode on one side, cathode on another, and the current goes from anode to, to cathode in conventional flow. So if you've got too many plus charges, which by the way, um, 
you really wouldn't because it's the electrons that are moving, right? Um, well, then you would go mostly, now I'm thinking backwards because I'm doing conventional versus, oh man, I just confused myself. I hate it when that happens. Let me back up a, let me back up a step then. So if we've got electrons, more electrons than necessary coming in one of these legs, we have a path for them to take that they can get out. So if the, the potential difference here becomes higher than five volts, we've got one path that it can take, right? So if this becomes higher than five volt potential, it can go out through the five volt net and go into the, the VCC. If we've got much less than five volt potential, right, a, a big negative voltage, well, then ground is higher than this. So charges will come from here, go in and discharge. So all you have to do is make sure these things are set to, doesn't have to be very high, but you want it to be high enough that it's not going to accidentally um, allow charges to go during normal current flow. But if you start getting anything over say 10 volts or whatever, it'll just pop right through the diode. Problem solved. To answer your uh, question, Jeremy, uh, I'm not telling you because that would be a security risk. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And I said computer, so you don't know. You don't know. And you better not guess. All right. Anyhow, that was today's ESD lesson, such as it was. And that was at Elliot's request, I think. Or maybe it was Andrew. I don't remember. But that was somebody requested that yesterday. So with that, what would you like to do next? If not, I can do some things. But I'll give you a second to uh, pop in. Any requests for what we should cover next on Office Hours with Mark? How did you guys like the uh, WalkWe? Isn't that a cool little bit of software? Yes? No? You're not going to tell me? All right. Be like that. Be like that. So let's stay on the ESD for just like 30 seconds more. Um, so what do we do with ESD protection stuff? This is something that I just got. It was, it's a piece of cardboard that costs 50 bucks. It, it really is, is crazy. Um, but what this is, is it's covered with a conductive film uh, or probably just a conductive spray paint or paint or whatever. It, it, doesn't conduct very well because you don't want to create something that is a short circuit hazard, something that can, uh, uh, you know, if you accidentally get some some live electricity going through it, you don't want to turn this into a flaming cardboard, you know, ignition source. So it's got, you know, so probably several mega ohms per, per meter resistance so that any charge that is on it, you know, if you do have a potential difference across the surface, it will resolve it. It'll take a while, you know, but it'll resolve. So what I'm going to do is put all of our parts in here, pull off a strip of each one, cut it off, put it in a bag, and mail it to you. And when I'm doing that, just because I don't want any ESD issues, when I'm doing that, I'll also be wearing an ESD coat and wearing ESD gloves. And I think I have my ESD coat right over there. So give me a second and I'll grab it for you. Ho ho, I lied. <laughs> I do not have it handy. So um, I thought I had it handy. I don't have it handy and I didn't want to spend any time looking for it. So anyhow, if you do have any other questions on ESD, I'd be happy to field them. Or if you want to come on screen with me, I would be happy to have the company. And yes, WalkWe is indeed impressive bit of software. Um, Yuri or Uri, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, is seriously one of the nicest people that you can ever, ever, ever hope to meet. 
And he has this pretty much ready to go for us. So we can put our firmware engineers to work, working on the rest of the firmware for us. And am I not visible? Let's go back to this. So a couple of the things I don't know if, if you caught just because he did do them kind of quickly and a little towards the end. If you need help doing anything, hit F1. That's where all of the hidden menu items are. Adding devices is over on the side. You can, um, whoops, you can click on things and it will give you a reference for how everything works and what functions are in there that you can mess around with and play with, right? A full list of parts. It's pretty extensive. He does have um, he does have some things in here that are useful to you. The logic analyzer we saw was pretty neat. Uh, the NeoPixels. Uh, by the way, he found the the issue and corrected it, so that's done. So we've got NeoPixels that we can play with. Um, we've got the. RGB LEDs that will function in our uh, our rotary encoders. We've got the uh, the five nine fives in here somewhere. I saw that earlier. This is equivalent to the part that we'll be using. Uh, it's a different uh, package, but it's equivalent to the the ones that we'll be using. To answer your question, Elliot, it's not the right type of rotary encoder, but um, it's close enough that. Let's see, is this, what's the rotary dot? No, that's not useful to us at all. No, he's got um, a different rotary encoder down on the bottom there. But if we want to simulate it, all that we would have to do is add basically two switches. I mean, we wouldn't be able to twist anything anyway, but this would give us the logic inputs that we need to figure out what the, um, actually, you know, something might be better would be slide switches, might be more appropriate. So if we did need to make our own rotary encoder circuit, it would be the RGB LED, two slide switches, and then um, this stuff. He doesn't currently have any analog electronics going, so there's really not a whole lot of, of point of adding in all of the pull-up resistors and the, the low-pass filters. That wouldn't matter anyway, so we just have to get close. Now, one of the issues with the, um, with the 595, right, if we want to have any amount of, and I can't think of the name, it, it, grayscale isn't the right word, but if we want any amount of quantification of the light levels, you know, like let's say you want um, each light to go from zero to 255, well, we're going to have to essentially strobe that on and off. So somebody's going to have to write some code that says, well, if it's at half brightness, um, I guess I should back up a little bit. The, the RGB LED and the 595. The 595 only has two modes, on and off, at each output. So that is going to have to either turn on, full brightness, or off. There are only two options. Except that this thing can run at blazing fast speeds. So you can have it turn on and off, you know, thousands of times a second. And by determining how, you know, over a second, how long it's on versus how long, long it's off, the duty cycle, then we can control the brightness of the LEDs. And that's what we're going to have to figure out. Um, we're going to have to write a little bit of code. It shouldn't be too bad, but we're, somebody's going to have to do it that says, all right, if it's 50% bright, 
it's on for half the time, it's off for half the time. If we're 25% bright, you know, that's how we're going to get different colors out of that. And if not, we can just have red, green, and blue, and, you know, the, the mixing colors of, of each one of those. Or if you want great, you know, gradations of that, then, then we have to play a little. So a gray code, is that a question or you're trying to help me out? I'm going to assume it's a question. Um, so gray code is a reflected binary code. When you have multiple switches flipping at any, you know, any period of time, um, it, what's a better way to do this? I want to back up for what I'm saying. Elliot's now saying ignore me. I'm not ignoring you. You gave me something to talk about. So when you have multiple switches flipping, it can look like noise sometimes to a microcontroller. So a, re a reflected gray code only flips one bit at a time. Um, with normal binary code, you know, it'll go 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, uh, then back to 0, 0. You can have multiple bit flips at once. And that's all well and good. But when you're rotating around, you know, one of those encoder strips, and I think I have this as part of course content. Um, when you have that re going around, you don't know if you're going to make the transitions at exactly the same time. So by moving over to gray code, you know there's only going to be one transition per angular increment. And it, it's easier to do error correction. So anyhow. All right. What are we doing next? Are we going to stare at me? I'll stare back at you like this. All right, I've got a question for you. What do we do about um, Mark Voids a Warranty? Have any of you guys had a chance to see that? And if so, what do, we th what do you think we could do to make it a little more useful or get more people to watch it? And I tell you, this would be a lot more fun if somebody would join me on screen. I'm feeling kind of lonely over here. Nothing. All right. I see how it is. Be all quiet like that. Well, fine. Well, then, while I'm waiting for you guys to play on screen with me, I'm going to go back to Dip Trace and do a little more organization on my schematic. So if you caught one of the live streams the other day, um, the first thing that I was doing was preparing to do layout. And that's what I'm going to keep working on. But uh, I will keep an eye out for questions and comments, and I'm happy to jump on any of them that you'd like to talk about. Diptrace does not like me having multiple monitor resolutions. It kind of makes it mad. All right, so the plan was simply to organize parts in preparation for layout. Uh, there should be a way to turn off rat line. View objects, view rat lines, get those gone. All right. Um, for those of you playing along at home, um, what I'm doing is grouping components. And since I have each circuit block incremented by the hundreds, all I have to do is look at the first number after the prefix to know if something goes together. For the things that have um, multiple blocks, for example, the rotary encoder, there's two of them. Each one of these is going to have an additional suffix, either one or two. The LEDs, it'll be one through ten. Uh, to answer your question, Elliot, you can do whatever you want. Layout in four layer is easy. Um, and if it's your first board, you might want to do that. 
But if you do have kind of a larger board, four layer is, you know, it's not quite, but pretty close to twice the cost of a two layer board. So two layer is cheaper for you. But most people are going to be ordering their own boards and they're going to be footing the bill. So it's kind of like, what does your budget allow? All right, so there's S502. And then all I have to do is hunt up other parts. Uh, where is placement by list? There we go. So all I got to do is find other things in the 500 range. And I know those things are going to go together. Oh, you can't see my screen, can you? Well, fine. How's that then? Huh? What? Huh? Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So all I'm doing is looking for things that have similar numbers because with the way that I set up my schematic, similar number things go together. And I will worry about um, laying them out in a minute. But for right now, I just want everything together. Those two will probably go down here. And I actually could have made these switches hierarchical as well, but I didn't. It's OK. All right, what's next? I haven't done the 400 series yet or the 600 series. And again, I am here to answer your questions. So if you have questions, ask them, ask away. OK, what is in the 400 series? Are those the rotary encoders? Let's go back to the schematic and see. Now, the three rotary encoders are 300. Oh, did I make a mistake? No? What is that? Is that a switch? Ah, the switches are 400s. OK, so I got 10 switches, each one with its own resistor and capacitor network. So each one of these is going to have a suffix attached to it. So the first switch, they're all going to end in 1. Second switch, they'll all end in 2. So it looks like I started that the other day. So now I need to get capacitor 4022 or 4012. So that's the nice thing about the hierarchical layout is it does make it pretty easy to organize things. You can never have duplicate reference designators on your board. Otherwise, the machines can't place the parts. One of the issues that we had with Teach Me PCB round one, when we ganged all the groups together, um, I had to write, and it, it wasn't a big deal. It took a couple of minutes. But I had to write some code that gave everybody a unique suffix because some people had similar part numbers. OK, what's left? So I'm going to group those together for a minute. I'm going to group these together for a minute. So the 600 series is support. No, 500 is for the Pico. 600 are for the RGB driver. So let's find other things that start with a 6.
These are not final placements. These are just getting things together. And then I will start laying things out in a manner that amuses me. Okay. 401.10. What was 400 again? So I just didn't finish. 401.9, 401.10. What did I just see? Resistors. Okay. So let's go back up here and grab resistors. So as you can tell, um, without this stuff, it would be a absolute nightmare. to sort everything out. Um, and since a lot of these resistors have the same values and they could get connected to the same net, you wouldn't necessarily know. But if you put them in the wrong spot, it makes troubleshooting and comparing to your, uh, your schematic an absolute nightmare. Okay, 401222. 3333. Looks like I'm missing R4014. But by using a hierarchical layout, it makes it absolutely tolerable. Especially when you have bigger designs. Okay. What's left? What's left? U701. All right. This is my logic level shifter, I believe. And I think that's the end of my grouping. The only thing that bothers me is what the heck that is. I don't know what that's showing me the center of. But hopefully I haven't screwed anything up too badly. All right. So going from the absolute mess that was the initial thing to everything's relatively organized now, I can actually start doing some useful layout. Um, and I guess that's what I'll do next. What's that? My light sensor? Yeah. Okay. Something bothers me about that. So I'm going to pull up the data sheet real quick. Um, so if this is the VCC and this is the GND connection, that means my I squared C is on the outside of that, um, which is totally possible. I just want to make sure I got my footprint right. It is. Okay. That's the way it works. Weird. All right. So... Might as well start with this first block. I'm going to route some traces. I've already set up my net classes in each one of those. So my only question is, how hard is this going to be to hand assemble or hand rework if something goes wrong? You want to put these capacitors as close as you can to the parts without um, interfering with the courtyards. but these parts that I got from some library I don't know if these are the least nominal or most material conditions because I didn't make them myself because I'm lazy um, so I'm going to leave that give me a little bit more distance something else I could potentially do is move this to the other side of the board especially since I'm hand assembling things, um, you know, and do it through a couple of vias, but not worry about it. All right. Now, um, I will have to make more ground connections later and more power connections later. But for now, this one is, you know, reasonably good to go. I wonder if...
Let me just clean that up a little. And then group everything again. Or am I already grouped? Oh, I'm not grouped. I'm a control D. There we go. Okay, so that part is done and ready to go. Next up, I've got the 200 series, which is the addressable RGB LEDs and getting those things ready to go. So, where are those hiding? They're down here. So I've got to figure out how I want to lay these things out. Um, like I did in the video the other day, it is completely possible to, um, to put the capacitor on the opposite side and then connect it through vias. But I am fine with it. I mean, my traces are a little longer than you necessarily like. Something that you can do here is just kind of move stuff around and see what the minimum placement distance distance would be. I am going to leave this here because it's easier to solder these um, from the edges. The, the soldering iron will come in from the left side and right side on this and left side and right side on this. So if I have to move something or rotate it, you know, if I do something stupid, like put every single one of my RGB LEDs on, rotate it 180 degrees, it's easier to fix. Not happy. Not happy. All right. Let's ungroup these for a second. Make sure they're on... and then group them again. So now when I move these things around, wherever they end up going, all right, so it looks like I have this, so then I gotta move a little bit stuff around. And then I can route traces. And then I can group it. So all I'm doing is just prepping for whatever layout that it is that I decide to do that I don't have to go chasing stuff later. Um, and by the way, I don't have to run these traces right now either. Um, they're going to be easy enough to figure out later. But nobody's asking me any questions, so why not? I see how y'all are. Okay, I need to hide messages. Got some friends with some family issues there. How can I... Don't show app icons, don't show number of new notifications. It looks like it's off. Oh, Ooh, I know. It's coming from the phone. Can I airplane mode it? Oh. Okay. Um, hmm. Yeah, what's up? Hi. 
Would you do me a favor? Yes. Would you text our mutual friend and check in on her? Something's going on. Let her know I'm online and I can't talk right now, and then I'll check in on them when we're done. Okay, sorry about that. I have a uh, friend's family, and they are struggling at the moment, so we try to help them out. All right. And then I have airplane mode, so uh, you won't see anything else. And then I'll have to learn how to turn that off, huh? Oh, I appreciate that. Um, but there's... Um, there's not much I can do to correct the situation. Um, and mm, what's a good way to put it without giving away too much information? Uh, the daughter is chronically ill at this point and very significantly ill and this is a friend i've had since high school and the stresses that that places on the family are huge so uh the friend desperately i mean it's, it's, it's chronic stress does stuff to you right so that was my friend's wife telling me to check in on my friend which i've been trying to do but getting him on the phone is been exceedingly difficult until you know like 10 o'clock at night so even if i left the live stream right now and went to go check on them which by the way i would drop you guys in a minute um i would absolutely drop you guys in a minute but um it wouldn't do any good he hasn't answered his phone at this time of night in 18 months at this point so she's just feeding me information to let me know what's going on with that particular friend, the wife is anyway, so that I can have a better idea of what's going on when I do finally get a hold of him, if that makes sense. So, okay. But just so you know, I'm not ignoring them. I text daily uh talk to the wife daily when uh when she's able to it's kind of hard for her to get away from the sick daughter um but usually the times that we get to talk is when the daughter's on the commode <laughs> it's about the only time she can get away but you know i go over there when i'm able and uh help out when i'm able i even completely retrofitted an electric wheelchair for the daughter. Um, I mean, did the metalworking, new headrest, new electronic control system, everything. Uh, that was a project that kept me busy for a couple months. My only concern is I don't want their business going out on YouTube on messages. So I think we got that fixed. I'm in airplane mode. And since it's and since it's my wife and I's friend, you know, had my wife do it. So, and really, like I said, all we can do right now is say, "Okay, thanks, I got the message." Oh, that one. Okay, so why is Dip Trace? giving these part centers. So this is the latest, greatest dip trace 4.2. I just updated it. And there's this background thing. I don't know if you can see all these blue X's that are showing me like old centers of parts. And I just don't know why they're there. That didn't used to be the case. So I don't know if that's a bug or if I need to reinstall dip trace or what okay 
There we go. So it's just weird. I don't know what that is. That's got to be a bug. So, okay. Anyhow, just getting things together. See, these are all my RGB LEDs. So now we've got the switch networks. Okay, so R1 and R2 are actually going to be involved with those RGB LEDs. I've, I did make a modification to the schematic, um, and I haven't really talked about it much because I'm still not happy with it. And in fact, I'm waiting on an email back from the company. See, terminating the last schematic, or not the last schematics, terminating the last um, diode here, why is D9D10 going to DN, D out? Oh, that's not good. Hold on a second here. D out, DN. Mm. Let's go back to the schematic. D out, DN, RGB led. DI, something's backwards. One wire RD1, DN, D out, it looks right. But then D10, so D10, in the D out should be to one wire D ten R that net. Let me turn back on uh, rat lines for a second. Objects. How is that possible? So this is the final output here. Why is that nine? Is this one right? Unless dip trace didn't increment them. Oh, you know what it is? I know what it is. I've upset dip trace. It doesn't like the way in which I've laid these things out. See how I kind of did this reversing pattern? It probably doesn't care for that. So let's update that. Let's see. Now here, let me back up for a second. So the issue is, I believe, the way in which the schematic was generated. Dip trace, I don't think, liked the fact that I did that reversing thing. I think these all need to be in a straight line. I have to... shoot all of those over in a minute, but or I wonder if the other thing I could do is do these numbers. I will just simply replace those in a minute after everything's moved. When it generated the hierarchy, uh, the net hierarchy, it auto-incremented each one of these. But I believe there is probably some programming setting that is saying um, either do it by rows or by columns. And since I had these things... Uh, Okay. 
Now getting dip trace to update this, I don't know how that's going to work, but Okay, that's close. Don't worry, I'm going to move these back on screen in a second. Traces from unoverlapping. This, that will cause errors. There we go. All right. I will regenerate all of these net names here in a second. Don't worry about that. It just takes it just takes a second. Uh, I just have to click show name again. I just want to see if I can get these all on screen here or if I need to move them. And then we have to hope that this fixes the problem. I don't really know that it will. Okay. Now let's go and we're going to do an update. First of all, might as well save it. Oh, I need to make sure that's saved. It is. And then we will update from schematic. To tell it which schematic I'm looking at. Um, everything's good. Use schematic settings, that's fine. Let's see if that got us anywhere. Nope. Hmm. <laughs> okay, well, there is another way to do this. Um, let me go back to check net hierarchy. Electrical rules are good again. Check hierarchy, no errors found. I wonder if I placed them in the wrong order. Will it tell me what that is? Problems right there. Okay. So then these two have to be flipped. It had nothing to do with the orientation of these. I laid them out wrong. I tell you, I'm the reason I can't have nice things. Okay. So th there was an issue with that, with the way that these things were numbered, but the issue was I, at some point when I was moving things around long time ago, schematic i made the mistake there it's nothing that would have been visible on the schematic itself so it's no error anybody would have caught until we did layout okay so now i've got some named nets one wire d78 and then i've got some random net name So one wire D8, D9, and looks like we're doing some magenta pink color. One wire D9, D10, fixed. 
uh, watercolor custom magenta. Okay, so now save that. Um, we'll show our net names. Well, silly me, silly me. Whoop, wrong button. I can clean that up in a little bit. I'm not too, whoop, nah, wrong button. I'm not too worried about that, but we've got it fixed. All right, so what do we got? Um, all good. Look, sounds like you got your priorities straight. Uh, right, I saw that. Very cool. I have no idea what you're talking about because I haven't looked back in a while. And I did the same thing in KiCad. Yeah, I mean, it's mistakes happen. You just have to be on the lookout for them and fix them when you can. So now when we go back and update... Nets with different classes, PCB layout. Ooh. Okay, so now where are we? Now this is my D10 out and it indeed goes to ground. So I can move that guy in there and terminate that net. All right, but I do see another issue. Oh, it's not really an issue. But the inputs are here. Outputs are here. So these things all need to be... Whoa, why is it doing that? That rotated around a weird point. I wish I knew what these things were doing. I will have to either email the developers or get into the forums and see what's going on with these random new centers. But anyhow, so now, you know, if I flip all this stuff over, connecting one to the next is going to be super easy. Now, um, notice how this trace is different than this one. It also relates to that error that we saw a minute ago, which was um, it got mad that the classes were wrong there were some differences so when i deleted those nets and created new ones um i need to move two more nets to the high speed data so all of those should be in the high speed data net so i'm looking for stuff called one wire oh and then see that net 10 what's net 10 i have no idea but we need to go find that and fix it. So I'm going to go over to my net editor. Ah, uh, it's this one. Okay. E10 determination resistor. Okay. Back to net classes. So I want to get all of those in to that net. Save it, go back here. I'm going to renew from schematic. Um, all the programs have slightly different terminology for how this works. Um, but now that net should be... No, it's not. Let's update again. By RefDes. Oh, you know something? It's a signal net. It's not going to be a power net, so it's not going to be have this have the same trace length. Ah, <laughs> I'm silly. Yeah, it was. It's very easy to connect them in the wrong order. Um, it happens. Doesn't really matter. Okay, so um, something to do with the way those things are grouped. It's creating that additional anchor point. And that's making life more difficult than it needs to be. So what's that an anchor point to? Way up over here. So ungroup. So what's happening 
I get it. So when I group stuff, it's creating an odd anchor point back from where some part used to be. So the anchor points aren't moving with the parts that I grouped together. But if I ungroup those, maybe, oh, that's weird. Yeah, that's buggy. They need to make that not a bug. All right. Well, any other questions here before I start to wrap this up? I'm happy to answer them for you. And if not, that's probably as far as I'll go today. Uh, maybe tomorrow when we do this again, you'll have questions. And I will start laying out the switches and go from there. Is it snapping to the center of the group instead of either of the components? So what I think it's doing, and it never used to do this before, when I make a group, right? These parts started off over here somewhere, I believe, because they were in a big pack before I, I started breaking them out to other locations. So by themselves, no problem. But when I group them, there's some remnant. Let's turn on every layer that I've got. There's some remnant that is left over from when that happened. So again, ungroup them, nothing. But the second I put these things in a group, something didn't get carried over. I don't know what, something. So anyhow, um, anyways, that's it for tonight. I ran a little over, sorry about that. I'll be back tomorrow. Uh, Friday, I'm doing my other class, so I won't see you guys. And uh, I'm online on Discord. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please feel free to let me know and I'll do my best to keep up with them. Thanks everyone. Have a good night.